moments i'm like and then i'm thinking what would i do in this moment there's a there's a circle of people around me who will shoot me if i try to run all i have is my words <laughs> and these people think he's a god yeah what do i do what's up man not too much i'm gonna tell you about my book it okay. finished the surrender experiment we got to the most excellent moment of surrender in the whole book. I've been waiting days to tell you this. Okay. So for those of you who didn't watch the last podcast, I'm very interested in this book, The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer, and it documents his life story as he, from the age of 20 onward, gets really into meditation, the idea of surrendering to whatever life brings. And I had questions with it because it's very clear from the book that he doesn't simply, uh, when somebody says, hey, will you do this, say yes every single time. He puts up a bit of resistance, but if you know, three things push him in the same direction. He sees a photo of someone. Uh, someone tells me to check out this particular yogi, and then he hears about it on the radio. He's like, going to India. You know, yeah. <laughs> He's got to go do that thing. So the book ends. He's got this $1.3 billion company that he's the CEO of, and he's not totally aware of it. Uh, but one day, the FBI shows up, and he comes in, and they've raided every single office that this thing has in wow. multiple states. Why? And he's, you know, okay, he's surrendering. He's like, okay, you know, he asked the guys if he can get him some coffee. Like, you know, what can I do for you? Uh, and he's very kind and polite. Okay, good surrender. Well, let me get this thing so it doesn't fall over. Uh, it turns out that a guy that his company was investigating for stealing and doing kickbacks knew that he was under investigation from his company, went to the FBI, and is like, there's a conspiracy. Everyone told me to do this, and if you don't throw me in jail, I'll give you the big names. So, and I, I'm taking him at his word. Maybe this guy's a nefarious comment. he's comment. the big name. The surrender guru the is, CEO is the big name. The CEO and all of the C-suite executives are the big names. So huh. this, this guy who, I, I do tend to believe him for reasons that I'll tell you later on, but... Uh, you know, maybe he really was just stealing money from this company. He gave so much of his money away over the course of his life. It seems silly at this point to try to steal it. Yeah. Uh, but this guy has stolen like six million plus dollars from this company, which to the CEO is, why do I care, right? Uh, and he says he knows that they've been investigating him. So for months, he's been trying to build up circumstantial evidence to say, oh, when you told me to account like this, that's why I accounted like this. So they come in, they steal steal fbi takes every email every everything every ever and at first he's like i'm not going to get a lawyer and then people tell him to get a lawyer so he gets a lawyer turns out that the government wants to make an example of this guy so they throw everything why at them uh because this is a ceo of a big tech company in the year 2000 right after the dot-com bubble uh who's got a 1.3 billion dollar company it's corporate malfeasance this is what the department of justice this is makes careers in the Department of Justice, right? Got it. And this guy has been telling them a tale that confirmation bias points back to. Well, the books are represented exactly the way he said he did. Uh, so they go in, they get all the emails. It's a five-year trial thing. Over the course of the trial, his lead attorney gets cancer twice. Oh, God. Yeah. The judge who was, they were doing pre-trial stuff and the judge is starting to see that there's literally nothing but circumstantial evidence pointing to any of the C-suite members. He's like getting ready to throw the trial out. He gets kicked out because he's, or not kicked out, he retires. Oh, and wow. a new judge comes in and they're like, oh my God, what do we do? Uh, and the bill for these 20 or so C-suite executives gets to $190 million. What do you mean the bill? the lawyer's fees what yes how's that possible it's 20 people you figure 10 million over the course of five years two million a year of a legal team just it's the government the full force of the u.s government is trying to put these guys in jail jesus uh and at some point i'm reading this i'm like doesn't sound like you're surrendering. It yeah, seems yeah, like yeah. the 190, universe. <laughs> 190 million dollars of fighting. I think the universe wants you in jail. Now, that doesn't mean that you did anything wrong, but yeah. I think that the universe has big plans for you inside of a 10 by 10 box. Yeah. Uh, and so that was the first thing that I'm thinking, which is like, this is not surrender. Yeah. And he keeps saying, you know, bad things happen. I just took a deep breath. And I need, I would love to talk to the guy because. I'm not understanding what he means by surrender yeah. if fighting something for five years for $190 million despite the judges, your lead prosecutor, every, you know, everything being thrown against you. It seems like the universe is telling you you have more to do inside of jail. 
Well, so somebody, because I was looking at our comments, shout out, thank you to everyone who commented yeah. why they listen. Appreciate you. I have a lot of work to do now. <laughs> uh, but I was looking at one of the comments that said that their definition of surrender, which doesn't sound like surrender to me, but I, I, get, I like it. They said that Eckhart Tolle, who wrote The Power of Now, he says, if you find yourself stuck in the mud, being surrendering to the moment does not mean sitting in the mud forever. It just means accepting you are in the mud, not being mad that you're in the mud, and then planning on if you want to get out of the mud or not. Yes. So it's not so much, surrendering is not so much about accepting any circumstance, no matter what it is, and then not trying to improve it. This commenter's definition was just accepting that's your current state, not getting mad at yourself or anyone else for having arrived there, and then... So maybe that's what he means. Maybe no, he's like yeah. not mad at the FBI. He's not mad at the person under him for setting him up. He just goes, you did this to survive so because you don't want to go to jail. You guys are doing your jobs. Now I'm not going to go to jail because yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah, do anything yeah. wrong, but I'm I'm not upset. I don't know if that's what he's saying. but That's 100% the idea of surrender that I get from Eckhart Tolle, which is it's very much about present moment surrender. Mm -hmm. Accept what is now don't fight the isness of the moment and i yeah. get that very much when i read eckhart i'd like to talk to this guy because it seems like he makes future life decisions gotcha based on three people told me to get into construction i don't want to but i will because life seems to be pointing me in this direction right so it, it seems to have it's a, like life told him to get in the mud yes. so he gets in the mud yes whereas eckhart says don't worry about how you got in the mud just with love choose your own path i'm in the mud now what is yeah. Eckhart? yeah yeah and this guy's like I'm in the mud and a uh, mud advertisement passed. So I will stay in the mud, <laughs> even though I don't want to be in the mud. That's what it That's seems like. And he might, I, I'm almost What's sure. What's his name? Uh, Michael Singer. I'm almost certain he would clarify this to okay. make more sense for us. But that would be my two, my question for him, which is how do you make these future plans based on this surrender? If it's only Yeah, how do you define surrender? your life by surrender while you fight a five-year lawsuit and spend $190 million yeah. on legal fees? And not just him. It was amongst the 20 or so C-suite executives. Yeah. What turns out happening, just because it's a really interesting story, is that uh, by the end of it, the government is realizing that their case is falling apart. There's, according to him and his team, nothing but circumstantial evidence. So mm -hmm. they're like dropping people left and right. By the time it goes to trial, there's three people, him, the CEO, the CFO, and, you know, one other person. And the, like the day before trial, they're like, okay, the CEO doesn't have to come in. We're just going to do the, the accounting people. Mm. And so he's like, oh, thank God, like justice is winning. Uh, it's a short trial. They go in, they read, you know, here's what happened, this this corporate malfeasance, yada, yada, yada. It's very short deliberation. They all come back, unanimous verdict, guilty. <laughs> the CEO is guilty? or the, the CFO and the other guy are going to jail for wow. years. And they do an interview of the jury after. Uh, and he says at the time when the verdict is read, he said he watched the judge's head slip into his hands as he shook his head. Yeah. And they did the this interview of the jury afterwards, and they said from the moment that they read their version of what happened, which, by the way, circumstantially is, oh, we have this email. It, he told him to do this. Like nothing within that contradicts itself. It just doesn't implicate anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of these corporate bigwigs and this, this lone whistleblower, it was just so compelling to these jury of his peers that it was done. Now, the judge who had seen... Uh, at this point, two or so years of them trying to make stuff stick was just like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And so he's heartbroken. But what winds up happening is there's this last ditch thing which shouldn't work, which is, oh, is this uh, within the statute of limitations? And the judge, in my opinion, uh, starts legislating from the bench or like, you know, and he goes, nah, not within the statute of li limit, like finds some weird thing whereby he just dismisses what the jury voted, yeah. throws the case out after they've come to a guilty verdict yeah and then chastises the department of justice and like just reads them like this has been a colossal waste of of effort and money and human resources and you should be ashamed of yourself type yeah. thing and they don't file for a a retrial appeal. or anything like that an appeal does the guy get away with stealing six million dollars i think so so this was brilliant by him because he went from i'm gonna go to jail to I've successfully stolen $6 million. I think he plea bargained down to a year and a day is what they said at a very light sentence. And I think he probably the money he had to point to and say, they told me to do this and he, he didn't get the money. Okay, but got it. he was looking at far worse circumstances. I think. It's still a good call by him to just completely blatantly lie. Maybe, who knows what happened later in his life or whatever. Yeah. Who knows what surrendering might've done for this guy. <laughs> but uh, 
just a number it was it was fascinating just from a legal perspective to be like holy cow uh a jury of your peers is more susceptible to a well-crafted story yeah. than an expert judge. But of course you want the jury of peers because it's multiple people, you don't have that one bias, but the way that he paints the picture, which I'm inclined to believe, is that they just heard what they said happened, didn't like these guys' faces, and yeah, were yeah. like guilty. Well, <laughs> little little plug for the power of charisma, yeah. but that's at the end of the day, that's what wins it, right? OJ Simpson. If, if the glove yeah. don't fit, yeah, you must yeah, acquit. Yeah. No one is. No one else is trying to put the glove on him. He's yeah. like, oh, I can't. oh, it's so tight. Can't get the glove on my hand. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I didn't do it. And they're like, fair enough. Yeah. So, yeah. And then there's that's, that whole uh, the jury uh, selection process, which is uh, there's experts that come in for that. Who do we want? Because people, the, the entire uh, presupposition between the behind the jury selection industry is that you can predict how someone's going to vote without having oh, them having to hear the trial. Yeah. <laughs> like they're going to vote along party lines or whatever it is. Uh, they, they tend to go for the little guy or they think that, that the little guy's a moocher. Like you could just tell, sure. oh, he's in the army. We, we definitely want that guy. Yeah. Uh, which is, I don't know what that says about the justice system. Yeah, it's know? all messed up. <laughs> yeah. Um, we got to have our buddy on who was, who was legislated, one of our good friends, Paul. Yeah, he's an appeals attorney and he's thinking about leaving because he's – been unable to free innocent people in his mind from jail and he has seen guilty people go free yeah in his mind again this is just his opinion right yeah. obviously jurors disagree with him but he's finding it to be very difficult to participate in a legal system that does make mistakes not infrequently totally so yeah that was my uh surrender experiment nice and it's... so at the end of the day we don't know what it means to surrender no still no <laughs> nice i've been trying and then the other thing. Yeah, what's I, going on in your life? Have you surrendered to anything that's led to positive or negative experiences so far? Nah. No, I mean, I've, I've been kicking back. I, you could definitely call it surrender. I haven't really done too much. Now, what I haven't done, and this is where I wanted to ask the guy. I was like, I mentioned this. Somebody asked me to quit my job and join their non-existent company at this point as Did a marketer. Did they ask one time or three times? One time. Well, that doesn't count. <laughs> you have to ask three times. And I'm, and I'm genuinely curious. Like, I, I'll play this game, <laughs> you know? Like, Yeah, please don't, though. <laughs> uh so do i just do that so i don't know how to do the surrender thing what i've been up to is watching uh mass murderers sociopaths and psychopaths mm. for a video mm. uh charles manson jeffrey dahmer uh ted bundy and jim jones do you know who do you know who jim jones is mm -mm. so this is the most fascinating one do you know who jim jones is never heard of it. okay so this blows my mind uh I'm going to give you an estimate because I'm very curious. Okay, Charles Manson. How many people associated – he actually didn't technically kill anybody, but how many people's deaths was he associated with, roughly? Three. I have no idea. It was a handful. It was, a hand, it was the, the Tate and uh, a couple other people that were killed. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. He, is the, he was the closeted homosexual that ate people? Yes. 30. It, we – oh, I kind of said yes. <laughs> it's, <somewhere, laughs> it's, like, it's in that double-digit ballpark. Okay. Uh, Ted Bundy. 15. I agree. That was I think it's 30 to 50, actually. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. Movie really underrepresented that. Yeah. Jim Jones. Well, you've kind of led me to believe it's <laughs> just high. Just guess. Just guess. He's a serial killer? Or He's a not cult a serial leader? killer. Who, can I get leader. his... He's a, cult. He's a cult leader. Yeah. Who did he kill with his own hands, or who did his cult kill? Well, I'm going to drinking the Kool-Aid is what comes from Jim Jones. Ah. Uh, oh, is this the, the, like, suicide in the desert guy? This is the Jonestown Massacre. Just take a guess. A hundred. Thousands. <laughs> okay, I like I like it. We've hit both sides. 918 people. The single largest uh, purposeful loss of civilian life in America's history up to that point and until September 11th. Wow. And you're looking at roughly 25 to 30% of September 11th happened this guy. And like, we don't know his name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so well, they all, did they all choose to drink the Kool-Aid, though? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, really? So, so There's some is, forced Kool-Aid drinking. Okay, let's put it this way. There were guys surrounding them with guns and crossbows. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. And some of them were like, do it, we have to. But, I mean... It, for, I did not know that. Yes. You pick, when everyone there, you think of drinking the Kool-Aid, it's always a joke on TV. And you, you see, like, 13 people wearing white robes yeah. voluntarily drinking it because they're part of the cult some that's, of them that's what's become i think in in society's mind like what the kool-aid I mean, incident the, was yeah so a third of them were kids 
Wow. Which is, I mean, what do you mean? Did they choose to drink the Kool Aid? They yeah. were the first ones. They were injected and or force fed. Injected. Yes, dude. He was prepared. So this. So Jim Jones. I'll step back. Uh, poor white guy grows up very in 1955. Incredibly progressive, integrated church experience. People say we don't want blacks in here. He goes, get out. You know. So like, he becomes very popular in the black community, and it's crazy to watch this guy uh, in sunglasses with a black church, <laughs> a white dude in sunglasses leading a black church, uh, essentially. And there's there's a handful of white people. It's called the People's Church, the People's Temple. Um, same sort of thing where they're in this town. He says, we got to go to this town. Then we got to go to this town. And I assume that it's mostly black people because white people at that time are prejudiced and don't want to pray next to black people. Well, some people did. Some One guy's like, look, he came in. He was talking integration. And I was like, that is the truth. And I got on a – he was doing buses around America. And if you wanted, you could get on the bus and you could come move to their commune. He's like, I got on the bus. Hmm. Uh, so they go – They you know, they do this whole tour. They, they have a place in California. They go to San Francisco. And uh, it comes out that he's uh, – a abusing his power in a number of ways. There's sexual abuses. There are people who want to leave the commune and he will not let them. And they have this on tape, like recording of him being like, did you want to leave? Like they're, they're ratting on each other. This is the other thing I've been looking up is Scientology, trying to find out what makes these cults work. Hmm. And one of the big things is this internal reporting. They essentially dismantle the, your family structure, replace it with the cult and have you, I mean, you will sell your own son, daughter, whatever out mm. uh so you know you tell your wife hey we got to get out of here and next thing you know you're being drug up because your um, wife because your wife, your turned, wife in. turned and told jim, jo jim wow. jones that you wanted to leave and now you're being chastised potentially beaten uh but you're not leaving yeah wow so the some people get out they tell like the san francisco whatever paper is and he gets advance notice the night before that this article is coming out so he says everybody get on the airplanes we're going to south america <laughs> He puts he puts a bunch of people on an airplane. So he's got money at this point. Well, some of the people have actually gone and started a commune down there. So they had like a place to go. I just meant he can he's flying hundreds of people to, on a moment's notice. I think they're flying themselves. Uh, I, okay. think, I think he's got some money and they give their money to him and then they figure out how to get there. So got they it. don't want to go. So he gets down there and he gets roughly a thousand people into uh, this place in Guyana. And for a while, it's good, but there's all these allegations. So a Congress, it, tell me if this is an interesting you. I was no, fascinated no, it's by this. A congressman, uh, a congressman, this is somebody, elected official who, like, he's, uh, the one thing that they said is he wanted to understand prisons for prison reform. So he spent a week in prison, you know, and there's photos of him behind bars. And so he's this very hands-on congressman, Congressman Ryan. He wants to go see what this cult is all about because they've gotten this terrible press and the people are also on record being like, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. So he goes down with a camera crew. They have cameras, <laughs> okay? The day before, it's all on camera. The day before the suicide. Yes. It's all on camera. Congressman is there and he's there having this big party and he's looking around. And he goes, I got to say, you guys, you know, I've heard a lot of things, but I've also heard people say this is the greatest thing that ever happened to them. And they erupt into, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're screaming. And it's, and the guys who have escaped are like, it was genuine. We were screaming our heads off. We were so happy. The Congress, you know, the enemies of, of the church had finally come around. Yeah. Uh, and the congressman is trying to talk, and he just can't help but smile and laugh because he's never experienced such rousing applause in yeah. his life. It's obvious. Next day, he's, like, getting ready to leave. And the guy, man, and I, I mean, I'm sure this haunts him. He wanted to get out, and so did several people, lots of people. But he, Jim Jones wouldn't let them. Yeah. He slips him a note into the cameraman's armpit, but the cameraman drops it. He picks it up. He goes, oh, you dropped this. And a nine-year-old boy goes... He passed him a note. He passed him a note. And so now, the, the, uh, this is the part where I'm trying to figure out what, what would I do if I were in Congressman Ryan's position. Yeah. So Congressman Ryan gets the note, sees this. They go with the camera crew up to Jim Jones. They say, what is this all about? He says, what does the note say? Please get me out of here. Jim won't let us leave. Uh, we want out. Please help us. And he says, what is this? These people want to leave. He says, these people. You now, why is he leaving? This, this guy is this. And now the whispers start and the tension is mounting. And people are coming up to Congressman like, you're in danger. You need to leave right now. And then it, the tension is mounting. And at this point, I'm going, what would I try to do to defuse this? Would I tell this guy, I think he's cra this guy is crazy. I'm going to get on my airplane. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go back. I'm going to tell Congress that this is all working out. But also, I'm sure he feels like if I leave, he's going to kill this guy. You yeah. know what I mean? 
So I don't know what I would do. Congressman is talking to him, and out of nowhere, a guy with a knife comes up behind the congressman. And people saw him. They said he was trembling and shaking before going, Die, you motherfucker! And then stabs the congressman. They have this on video. They, I don't know if they have this on video, but they have a wounded congressman in blood moving towards the airport, like trying to get to the airstrip. Oh, my God. So the congressman goes to the airstrip with his team, and they have people that have survived this. They get to the airplane. A car rolls up the side of it. Guys step out with guns. Just mow down everyone at this little prop plane. And a handful of people hide behind the wheels. Uh, you know, they don't get shot immediately. But the guys come off and they finish people off. They shoot them. I'm like, and this one woman gets shot. She survives at point blank range. Like she didn't get hit. And then he, it's, it's crazy. So wow. like he's ordered people to kill. Then the next Why thing... did this escalate? So so it sounds like in my head, he wants to lead a cult. He was being persecuted in the US. He successfully gets to South America. It's all working out. Mm -hmm. Why is he killing everybody? He is killing everybody because at the best that they can do is he didn't want people to leave him. And he also gets this God complex. And the power that he has, I mean, the stories, one woman tells a story of how she's extremely young. Jim Jones corners her in the back of a car, says, I'm doing this for you, and then rapes her. You know, and, and she acquiesces because this is God's God on earth, you know, mm -hmm. Jim Jones. Uh, but abuses of power... Uh, the real God complex stuff going on. Uh, you know, one woman was talking about another woman's body. She said, well, you should strip down and Jim Jones do it. And then they strip down and berate her naked body. Like just power mad stuff. Hmm. Uh, and he's afraid that people are going to leave him because he knows that they want to. And he knows the congressman, is the jig is up. And so then they have all of this. I don't know if they have video, but they have audio of, of, the drinking and he goes the congressman is dead and the people are freaking out and screaming he says you think they're gonna let us get away with this right and this is the other thing that i see which i might make in this video is there's this conflation of me and you you like with these people like uh you know they've done something terrible you're gonna go to jail <laughs> you know it's like why would why would we go to jail yeah, like, yeah, yeah you ordered him killed but of course that does that's not even occurring and what's fascinating is there's this one woman who speaks and he says if anybody disagrees that we should do this please speak now and she speaks up and she doesn't say fuck you you lunatic i'm not going to drink cyanide i didn't kill anybody she says if we do this our enemies win we uh, like she's like on his team still yeah, yeah. It, like our enemies our enemies we have to fight this jim we have to be brave and, and she sounds genuinely convinced of what she's saying huh. uh and they she gets shouted down you know and like and it's combo i've been watching these the scientology stuff like what they effectively do is they keep communication above amongst the yeses at a fervor pitch and they even inflate it with like fake yes from people who don't really mean it and they take anybody who says no and they find out how to crush you mm -hmm. and if you should make a connection with another no they destroy that such that in these moments i'm like and then i'm thinking what would i do in this moment there's a there's a circle of people around me who will shoot me if i try to run all i have is my words <laughs> and these people think he's a god yeah what do i do I don't know that I have the answer. I think you probably get shot. <laughs> I think I just, just, just all um, lay down. You fake drink. You just pour it over your shoulder. Yeah. Like, yeah. You well, you foam at the mouth. And so anyway, they all get shouted down and they start with the kids and people are losing it. And by the time you've fed cyanide to your child and the one guy watches his wife, he doesn't want to do it. Hmm. But his wife feeds his infant cyanide and then she drinks it and dies in his arms. And then he's just like. And then he's just he just runs and he gets into the woods. You know, a handful of people got into the woods. Wow. In any event, f it's crazy on so many levels. Fascinating, but also nobody knows about it in yeah. the same way that we know about Charles Manson yeah, yeah. and Ted Bundy. Uh, and it's weirdly, I wonder if these things aren't. It, you're more likely to be involved in a dangerous cult, maybe not drinking the Kool Aid, than you are to be serial murdered. Yes. But it's like this isn't whatever captures attention or is often discussed. Uh, well, it could also have been because it was if, maybe if it had happened in the 80s, everyone would know about it. It's like it. 79, man. Oh, I thought it was the 50s, you said. No, 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 no. Sorry. He started talking 
uh, integration in the 50s. Oh, this happened in 1979. It was in the set. It was late oh, 70s, I wonder, man. I wonder why. I wonder why no one talks about it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if it feels like something that couldn't happen to you. Uh, and then I started watching Joe Rogan experience Scientology people who talk about uh, very similar mechanisms of control. Yeah. Well, you've seen the documentary Going Clear, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how, uh, you know, you you basically, the biggest thing is that you you have to destroy their other strong connections. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to put yourself above that because the thing that gets people out is a brother or, or someone that they love and trust or they have a kid and or a friend says, hey, this is bogus. So you have to make the doctrine stronger than the friendship. It's crazy. So anyway, I don't know if this is interesting to people if I should do a video on it. I feel like it's super interesting. But unfortunately, I don't know what to call the video, which will ultimately decide how many people watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think it's fascinating. The other thing is I don't know if it's fascinating to people who want to become more charismatic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's fascinating. Take notes. Separate them from the Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So for, for a you. channel that's meant to be self-improvement, maybe it wouldn't hit the core audience. Well, I weird, think it's interesting. Weirdly enough, it's defending against it, which which for many people isn't an issue. But uh, yeah, I looked at some of the Scientology stuff, and they, they often get people at these, you know, crossroad times in their life and uh, anyway it was it's been a weird couple of days so you're in a weird headspace just deeply <laughs> i just walk into your room it's like 4 a.m the lights are off all i see is the light from your computer yeah. screen you're just watching charles manson interviews yeah and jet Dahmer, bundy all these guys uh and then there was this other weird connection which i don't think is uh, i don't know what to make of it but both Dahmer and bundy and i think uh bundy even says describe a fascination with uh, morbid pornography and how pornography for them was a gateway. I don't think that meant that pornography was causal, but that that was sort of the path that they walked towards mm -hmm. more extreme things. And Ted Bundy says that uh, he doesn't know a single person who has done something like heinous like this that is not deeply involved in pornography. That's not to say that, por again, I don't think that pornography is causing it. Pornography or morbid pornography? I think, uh, I don't want to misquote, but he says pornography, I think. Um, these like types I could of probably find a lot of, I'm like, there's not a single professional yeah, 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 athlete yeah. that's not involved in pornography. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. could find a lot of people. Absolutely. What, what percentage of the population watch, has watched or watches pornography, I wonder? I don't know. What percentage of this room? <laughs> <laughs> Can you pull that up, Justin? <laughs> I don't know. And yeah, I, I didn't find it uh, compelling, but but Well, if it's morbid, if it's morbid pornography, if it's, you know, uh, narcolepsy, necrophilia yeah, yeah, yeah. type stuff, that could be, I could see that being an indicator. But of course, it's an indicator, but which came first? The desire to see that or did that plant that in the person's head? It's, it's No, like, no, probably you're born, I think you're born with a different brain. Psychopathy. Yeah. And that, because I think most people probably necrophilia would discuss them more so than arouse them. So I think you're born with a different brain such that when you do see that, it's arousing. And, yeah. and then you keep watching. And then you can go, and then you you go, go oh, down that rabbit what's hole. more intense than this? Doing it. Yeah. Living it. Yeah, sure. So, But maybe that would mean that if you had some way of tracking necrophilia viewers, you could. What is that movie where Tom Cruise tries to stop crime before it happens? Yeah, Minority Report. You could like Minority <laughs> Report serial killers maybe yeah. by finding. I wonder if they do. Morbid pornography viewers. Yeah. But if it's just regular porn then i feel like now you just have to watch 75 yeah. percent of the population i <laughs> probably yeah probably most at that at that level did you get any numbers justin um the last number i could find was in 2013 so it's pretty outdated yeah it was only 12 percent, which doesn't sound great yeah that, that is surprising hold on i'm gonna see if my dog's crying i think she might have to go to the bathroom okay <clears throat> let's see if this is a false alarm for attention girl or if you have to go to the bathroom come on all good yes the dog has gone to the restroom <laughs> so yeah tell me something not about serial killers because that's been my it's been my last four days and sure. i apologize for the darkness no it's it is interesting yeah what's the guy's name jim jeffries jim jones okay jim jeffries is a comedian yes <laughs> don't screw those up <laughs> did you hear jim jeffries had 900 people commit suicide <laughs> crazy at gunpoint what yeah. I mean, and a congressman you know <laughs> that was the other thing they're like we thought the congressman was a shield and he even at one point tells a guy he says I'm, I'm nervous. He says, don't worry. You got the shield of the U.S. Congress here. It's, and he's like, he says, I remember thinking, you crazy SOB. You don't realize where you are. Yeah. Like, you're in Guyana. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are mercenaries with guns everywhere. Ah, crazy. But anyways, what else you got? All right. So hard tangent from <laughs> yeah, yeah, psychopaths yeah. and cults. So you know our buddy Brandon? 
I do know him. Yeah. So I don't know if you know this. He has had a lifelong dream of being a performance coach for yep. the New York Knicks. He loves mental coaching and stuff like that. He recently got his dream job with the LA Clippers. No, and I, he didn't. Yeah. And no. I was told, yep. Amazing. Yes. Dude. And I was, I was asking him how he did it and I got the story. Okay. So this guy, this so, friend of ours runs a YouTube channel called the jump rope dudes. Mm -hmm. He's him and Dan, and he's got what? Four or 500,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. Not LA Clippers numbers in my mind. Correct. Wow. Yeah. So this is a story for people who think that they have outlandish <laughs> dreams. That's and, why I wanted to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, <clears throat> He grew up in Portland, first of all, but he was a New York Knicks fan because I think he was born in New York. So this is an outlandish dream, a kid from Portland that wants to be an integral part of an NBA team, like on the ground, helping them perform at their peak, right? It's the kind of thing that when a kid says they want to be an astronaut, yeah, that yeah. level of crazy. So he was living in Colombia and he decided, okay, if I want to pursue this dream, I have to get back to the US. So he moves to LA. He reaches out to somebody who he finds out does this job for the Utah Jazz and just starts a correspondence with them and subscribes to their email newsletter, right? Nothing crazy, but he's now he's like receiving what that person is doing, yeah. keeping updated in their life. That person shares a video, just goes, hey, there's a performance coach in LA. Her name is blah, blah, blah. Here's a great video from her, just sharing it to his audience. Brandon sees it, finds the woman who does this same performance job in LA and buys tickets to two of her workshops. So she does what he wants to do. So he pays to go attend these workshops on mental uh, performance coaching. Goes up afterwards and just starts talking to her. Yeah. So, hey, what's up? These are like pretty intimate workshops. I don't remember how much they cost. Well, but she's also, and this is what's brilliant. She's not famous outside no one knows of this. Her, yeah. No one knows her name. You've got to be super niche focused yep. to even show up at this thing. Yep, exactly. Yeah. He said it's not a big room. And he goes up and tries to talk to her after both events. You know, whereas other people might just come in and He's say twice. Yeah. say oh thank you so yeah. much so he goes in and at the end of the first event he goes oh this was so great blah blah blah. i'm brandon i do similar stuff i've been working with some amateur boxers because that's the other thing he's pursuing his dream job by doing it for free at a smaller scale right yeah, so yeah. his dream is nba coach he joined a boxing gym found promising amateur boxers and started coaching them on mental resilience and stuff like yeah, that yeah, yeah so then she after the second workshop she says hey i'm the mental resilience coach for the la clippers do you want to do some free work for me helping them because this is your dream he goes yeah he starts going and doing work for free as her she helper apprentice Kawhi? not yet so then he gets brought into the clippers to give a presentation not to the players but to some random vp that you've never heard of and starting next year he will be working as her assistant for mental resilience coaching for the la clippers so he's gonna be hanging out with Kawhi leonard yep Kawhi Leonard, what? Paul George, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's crazy, right? And so it's such an interesting path. Uh, he just starts following everybody that's doing his dream job, right? And then he finds someone near him, goes to the workshop, befriends her, starts doing free work. Boom. I also th I think the biggest thing, I was like, how can I apply this? Like, I don't have a dream. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. I think the clarity w was massive. He's like, I want to be a performance coach for the New York Knicks. So yep. he knew... He knew one, he, New York, so he didn't go there. But he knew basketball. He knew performance coach. He knew all of these things to be part of. Yeah. Good for him, man. And I think what what uh, I really do think the clarity is the piece because I was like, what do I want? It's like I want to have like uh, more podcast guests, but it's not like I want to have the podcast on blah 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, good for him. That's awesome. No, doggedly pursued it. Took, but it didn't take him decades to do you know he's been in the u.s for two years i think yeah and he's been doing a lot of other stuff it's not yeah. been anything but a uh side hustle yeah for him but it did remind me it reminded me of another friend of mine who did the same thing he wanted to befriend matthew hussey yeah. so he he paid to go to one of his events and then afterwards went up and talked to him yeah it's it's, it's an interesting strategy i've seen repeated it works so i as i look at uh there are definitely been people, and we're not we're not as tough to get in touch with as Kawhi Leonard and the Clippers staff, I think. But there's a on any given channel, there's in a mass of people that are going. So if you try mm -hmm. to hit my email inbox, you're doomed. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's the most popular place. YouTube comments, take a look. Not a great place. Uh, Instagram DMs still very crowded at this point, but less. You know, you mm -hmm. stand. At, I might even see it. Yeah, though I don't. I don't. But often. if you're a Charisma University student, or if you go to an event you're speaking at, yeah, 
much smaller pool. Exactly. So once you narrow down these pools and uh, and I think that in person power yeah. is, is I'm incredible. sure if he had just emailed her, it would have been much harder to form that sort yeah. of instant connection. Oh yeah. Uh, that's incredible. Yeah, you, it's pretty dope. Is there right? anything that you want? No, nah, I was thinking <laughs> about this. So I did uh, I did a mind bloom yeah. last night. Had a psychedelic mind bloom experience. So that's a ketamine experience. Yeah. It's a small dose of ketamine that makes you have a psychedelic experience. And I was thinking about that. I was because I was thinking, what should I? I didn't really have an intention this time. Yeah. So I was like, what should I think about? What should I do with my life? Like, what what should I improve? Yeah. And I really struggled. I, <laughs> I don't. Great. Yeah, no, it's great. That's that's the thing is the the I stumbled upon two things. One was just to try to be more joyous because it's like truly your circumstances are ridiculous. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, so just trying to be more joyous like I walk the dog every day. It's becoming very routinized It's not something I take joy in but I easily could other people who don't know the dog see the dog and flip out and smile. Oh my god She's so cute. I'm like, yeah, I know I live with her. Yeah, so I was like, okay, just try to find more joy in Circumstances rather than trying to change circumstances. Mm -hmm. so that was my one takeaway And then the other was the voice note I sent you which I still a little under the influence But <laughs> just saying the one thing I, I, I felt bad because I know you are starting to burn out making videos. So offering to share that burden yeah, was yeah. the second takeaway. And then that was it. That was my entire mind bloom experience. So, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. Was yours was yours uh, grounded in very like practical? It sounds like yours are often more practical. Well, you know what? I think for me, so the thing with these, and people ask this actually sometimes, what's the difference between a plant medicine and a drug? Yeah. Or I've heard people take LSD and go to parties. Why yeah, are you yeah, saying yeah. LSD is a self-improvement drug? Which I actually, I don't say that, but I say that about psilocybin. Yeah. And I think it's a lot to do with environment and intent. Oh, and normally I put in headphones that have nondescript binaural beats and I wear an eye mask and I sit alone with no notes, no phone for an hour plus, And that lets you deeply explore your mind. Yeah. Right. Normally I have someone to watch the dog. Yeah. Last night, the person who was going to watch the dog got sick. And so I didn't have that deep of an experience because every 10, 15 yeah, minutes yeah, yeah. or so, she would just make a noise or come jump on the bed or yeah. something. And I have found that with a lot of these inner journeys, whether they're through meditation or holotropic breathing or psychedelics, that you get to the good stuff in the, pro you know what I mean? Like deep in the process. Yeah. And so if you take ayahuasca, but every 10 minutes, check your phone, I think you're going to have a freaking, like a freak out experience <laughs> yeah, and you're yeah. going to see weird stuff, but I don't think it'll be life changing. I think mm -hmm. part of why ayahuasca is life changing is people go to shamans and they sit for eight hours in yeah. a circle with their eyes closed. And so that's what gets you the depth. It's not just taking a substance. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I think no, my dog, I don't want to say ruined. Uh, the entire journey became about my dog last time. I was, yeah. Cause he was just, I was like, maybe he's the answer to all of the things because he's all that's in my consciousness right now yeah. as he tries to cover my face. Yeah, no, no, that was a big thing for me. I'm actually gonna, I'm not going to do my last mind bloom experience until I can guarantee myself an hour Some plus space. of complete silence complete isolation yeah interesting well that's good i think it's i've i've had that same i hear people that are at stages where they're incredibly ambitious and something like this our friend brandon who like gets that thing and that's awesome and it stokes something in me which is oh you got to pick something that you want and you got to go get it yeah yeah but i did it dude it was build cruise one command <laughs> yeah yeah and i and i also think that uh in what is it i think it's david hawkins is letting go he talks about different levels of emotion and he he associates them with an associating <laughs> vibration frequency what was that <laughs> she heard a noise in the hallway <laughs> uh <Just> protecting us <laughs> they have uh i don't necessarily buy into the frequency he's got like numbers to it yeah but he talks about how they they go up in a scale and at the very top is love and at the very bottom is apathy towards the bottom is desire and i agree with that mm. i think that being in a state of desire it's better than feeling blah, but it's not the same as uh, peace or yeah. But joy. you know, you know, how I feel about this though. I think life has stages. If you if you've spent your whole life, whether you're 18 or 40, pursuing educations and jobs that you weren't super passionate about, and you just found the four-hour work week, yes, I do not think you should go. Oh, desire is a low-level emotion. I'm going to pursue peace. It's that, like, that's why. Um, the advice, the, the use of this is the advice that you should take depends on where you currently identify yourself on this ladder, if you will. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So that's if you're not... at your job and you're just apathetic, it's like desires, great. Yeah, no, <laughs> like... I think I think for some people, the absolute best thing for me when I when I was 23, the absolute best thing you can have is a burning desire to change your circumstances. Yes. I think that's 
even better than the ability to exist in your current circumstances. Because I could have had a job I didn't really like and gotten married and uh, had a family that I wasn't really excited about and just worked on accepting those circumstances. But I think it's nice to have a period where you go, I'm going to make my dream come true, right? And then I think after that, you go, okay, now instead of making up a new dream, instead of fabricating something to have a new goal to pursue, I'll focus on inner peace mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Sure, sure. I don't know. That's my current thing. I, I actually, I don't want to judge people who are in the phase where they're like, I'm going to take control of my life. No, no, that's, no, I don't want to either. Uh, I think the, o the only slight adjustment I might make, and we've talked about ages, is that rather than tying it to age, tie it to emotional circumstances. If you're 23 and you've achieved enlightenment, you don't need to go read the four hour work. Week. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And if you, no, that's, sorry, that's what I was trying to say was whether yeah, yeah, you're 23 yeah. or 40. Yeah, if yeah. you spent your whole life pursuing other people's goals, mm -hmm. I think it's awesome to set off and do your own thing and be, yeah. the, be the doctor who wrote in saying she's going to become a journalist. Mm -hmm. I think those are, that's great. I sure. think that the, the thing you do after that is try to look for equanimity and inner peace and things like that. But mm -hmm. I, I think it's, no one should try to jump to that if that's not the stage they're at. I agree. I agree. It's not about. Uh, it's not about. This ladder isn't meant to be moved up at breakneck speed. Yeah. It's it's meant to uh, be gradual levels of in, of improvement and sort of a guide for hey, what might be next in my paradigm? Yeah. Life cool. thing. What else do you have? Anything before we go to news? Oh yeah. Let me look. Oh, this was just interesting, but I I knew you'd like it. There's a Mike Posner quote from his Jay Shetty interview. He says, "In order to not feel judged." judge people less mm -hmm. and i thought you'd really like that yeah, the, yeah. the thing he highlights is when you're obsessed with your weight often when you see other people the first thing you think are, yeah. is their weight right yeah. and so now you're living your life obsessed with your weight and every time you see someone you think about their weight so you start to think that the whole world sees you and the first thing they think about is your weight and what what mike posner was saying is they might not care about weight at all and the yeah. first thing that they think about when they see you might have nothing to do with that, but you judge other people so much based on this thing that now you feel judged by other people about this thing that you're insecure about. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting how it kind of accidentally forms this uh, this vicious cycle on your on your psyche where you're judging yourself, you're judging other people, and then you imagine you hallucinate that other people are judging you. Yeah. And so he said the cure is to just stop judging other people. Yeah, I think it's. Uh... I think there's it's weird it's a circular system that has two input points and it's like mm -hmm. what should it's like you kind of have to try to attack both at the same time or at least the one that's lagging behind because i totally i totally agree with his assessment i am um, one of the things i would used to care more about was being stronger being able to lift more i mean you could tell if you look at the old videos i have about <laughs> 10 to 15 extra pounds of muscle charlie inside. was yoked not yoked not yoked i just cared more uh, and I can tell you at that point in my life, it was absolutely something that very early in interactions I noticed, particularly about other men, was yeah. their level of physical fitness. And today, I care less <laughs> about it. And I also, it's not what registers to me as quickly in other people. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the way in for every, it, it can be, you could try to do both at the same time and they both either help one another or hurt one another is yeah. kind of what is kind of what i've seen did but. i ever tell you about when i got when i got humbled by a jack dude no it's my own judgment really is what humbled me i was i was working out at this gym in vegas i saw this dude that was just a physical specimen yeah. just shredded vegas and by the way is insane so this is the other thing that might have shifted when we lived in las vegas and you go to the gym even in my whatever 10 pounds heavier i was top bottom 10 percentile smaller guys because yeah. they are steroids and and pure meat and lifting all the time well and this guy was super handsome well then you, you go to la and it's like yoga yeah, yeah. <laughs> pilates like like vegan and all of a sudden it's like i'm doing great i'm doing all right <laughs> but anyway go ahead no no so i saw this guy I, at the time i was really into weightlifting and so i was i identified as a big guy and so i saw him and insecurity started to come up and then i i was like oh that guy is probably on steroids oh, i bet that guy's a jerk i bet all he does is lift weights like he's not running a business like i could be that big if i i'm like thinking all these things to try to put him down yeah so that i don't have to feel bad about being below him in this one area well he was pretty far away when i was making all these judgments and then as i get closer he goes hey what's up man 
and I turn around and it's a guy I've trained with in jujitsu oh. who was super nice. He was a white belt and I was a higher level person and we trained together and he was, he was really humble, really nice. He runs a supplement company. He offered me free supplements <laughs> and I went, oh my God, I just spent 10 minutes imagining this guy was such an asshole so I could feel good about myself. And he's really this awesome dude that I've met before. It was yeah. really, and it, it stuck with me. It was really humbling. So now I find myself have a moment where I see someone and I do get jealous or insecure. Uh, I can laugh at it instead of trying to put them down in my head. Mm -hmm. So it was a really useful, humbling experience for me. It's like, just because someone's better than you at something that you value doesn't mean that they're a bad person yeah, yeah. or worse than you in other areas. I mean, the thing, I, I think different ways help different people. What has stuck with me recently is that uh, I don't think that I, I've, I've learned increasingly N not to assume that from from small pieces of evidence you can intuit somebody's entire life experience yep. and it's like man if i had what they have if i was as famous as justin bieber or this but it, it doesn't take a lot of reading uh, his interviews or whatever to see that justin bieber has some tough experiences in his daily life you mm -hmm. know i a year into his marriage he's like this is hard yeah. which is code for i spend time not happy with my life you yeah know? yeah there was something else, someone else to, I told you, I just Wait. watched the Kevin Hart thing. And yeah, we like, talked about this last week with Kamal yeah, and yeah. Kamal Ravikant, yeah, Aubrey yeah. Marcus. Yeah. Just being like, yeah, people are, people. Everyone's having a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> we're not, we're not. Maybe, maybe yeah, it's yeah. the person you think is physically unattractive that has a bad job and you're, you're judging them actually negatively and they're really happy. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that, and then, yeah, the person who's happiest is the one who you think that you're. <laughs> you're better. Oh, I'm so much better than that person. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're just happy with whatever their circumstances exactly. are. That's yeah. more. That's more likely. Uh, what else you got? Do you want to talk about The Witcher, or is that too early stage? You want we to talk, talk about, about it later? It. Yeah, so what's going on? You're making a Witcher video. I did the Witcher video. Oh, it's, it's done. Yeah, it's done. Thanks. Uh, it's recorded. He. I mean, I was watching. I was going. This is the perfect type of fantasy thing that our audience likes. This is, I think, going to be big. And then I was watching it for charisma, and I was like, "Oh no, <laughs> no, Geralt, do something!" Yeah. <laughs> and I and it wasn't there at least verbally. But I do think what Henry Cavill did a good job of is making him communicate through his physicality. Mm -hmm. So I was able to find things, uh, body language things that are that the way that he conveys status, power, comfort through his body language and occasionally a grunt or two yeah just uh, a f-bomb yeah <laughs> and uh it it's also got because i think this is interesting i started watching animal videos mm. of uh you know for instance one of the things is his comfort turning his back on other people people who might have indicated that they pose a threat you know and threatened him seconds before he just casually turns around and i got some good footage of like you know lions at a watering hole just enjoying their water while like zebra like lurk behind them and they obviously couldn't care less you yeah. know what i mean they're not hungry right now who cares about these zebra yeah, yeah. but if a zebra ever has its back to a lion it's dead you know what i mean well, it so runs. That, that doesn't happen it just it, runs it runs it's frantic yeah so there's a lot about uh non-verbals non and predator slash prey signals which in the social world come down to signals that you're comfortable at ease and don't see threats in your environment mm -hmm. and then signals that you're constantly vigilant and see threats everywhere so that's kind of what nice the video anything, is about anything that you thought was interesting that didn't make it into the video what did i think was interesting i mean the thing i didn't use like, is he like literally snarls several times let's just say <laughs> henry he's like what are you doing <laughs> i was like that's interesting but you know not I not, not something you want to advise yeah, people to like, do snarl now <laughs> you know i don't know when to tell people to snarl uh what else was there the one thing that i noticed of this is didn't make it in of course but the gratuitous nudity yeah that's what <laughs> i told my mom so was insane i was recommending the show to my mom and i was like listen if you want a fantasy show that's very interesting that has does some interesting thing with timelines and has an unnecessary amount of boobs yeah that's your show yeah and i was uh, have you seen it justin no i mean there's there's a scene arguably early on in the season where she's going through a physical transformation and her body has changed. Okay, fine. But then there's one where she's just casting a spell. Yeah. And it's just... Oh, no, it's gratuitous. There's there's orgies when they don't have to <laughs> yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's people... People are getting ready for war and they're wearing dresses. The, yeah. These women are wearing dresses for, <laughs> and they for battle. Like, yeah. And there's just huge cutouts yeah. for as much breasts as possible. I, I'd be wearing armor if I were you, but... 
I, I you have to assume, and, and I saw this in Game of Thrones, like, now that actress, now that she's in, will never shoot that scene again, right? Like, she's done, yeah, essentially. Yeah. She's maybe once more, this is what happened with Amelia Clark. Season one, several. One other in season three, and then nada. You yep. know, she's she's not going to do that again. I, wa- I think this actress is probably in the same boat, but it's like, weirdly, the price that you have to pay in these fantasy genres, and I suppose... The showrunners clearly think it's important. Like, why would we force this in? Yeah. And which begs the question, is it? Am I not? Yeah, yeah. Am well, I missing something? Maybe even though, because when I was watching it, my front brain was like, listen, I like breasts, but this is a lot. <laughs> this is just, a, there's an orgy with t- just tons of them. Just tell the story. I'm here for the story. I did sign up for it. I wonder if in my back brain, though, it's like, mm-hmm. you have my full attention. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, this I, scene wouldn't have been interesting without the breasts, but yeah. you have my complete Plead attention. That's totally possible. That that if you look at the data of the episodes and you go, wow, there's spikes here, here, and here. And then you look at all the fantasy genres, you go, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> like three minutes of boobs makes people tune in. I don't know. It's, Could not, be. I it's mean, not what it, I'm thinking. Well, arousal certainly they've seen leads yeah. to sales, right? It leads to poor decision making. Mm-hmm. They've done tests where they have people fill out a survey, like a self-assessment, and then watch pornography and fill out a similar assessment. And their risk tolerance goes way up. They're willing to break the law to get laid way yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. They're more depraved. Like, certainly arousal changes your decision sure, making. Sure, sure. So maybe it makes you tune in more. Maybe it makes you less likely to change the channel. I don't know. Yeah. I, or it could just be like the appendix of the TV industry, which is we've always done it this way. We're going to keep doing it this way. Well, they because- have though. Boobs on TV is relatively new. Well, I guess I, I mean the HBO thing. I think I think that's kind of how HBO distinguished themselves in early seasons. It was like we're the only ones who can do this. Yeah, <laughs> and I get forget the show. Services. Apparently, there's a show that's all about full frontal dude. My mom was <laughs> like, I really like the show, but there are so many penises. I'm I'm so tired of it. Interestingly, I have never seen a show like that. It's on HBO or something. Well, what's interesting is that shows that your mom is interested no, in. No, no, she watched it with my dad. It's okay. It's uh. I'll, I'll try to get the title. Don't, I mean, I, I don't know that anything about it. I don't watch a ton of TV. I'm, it's all fantasy genre for me at this point. But yeah, that's all that I really have to say about The Witcher for now. Check it out either next week or the, or the week after that. My phone's going to think that I'm a very, uh, <laughs> just Googled TV show with male full frontal. <laughs> it's going to go, oh, this is what, these are the kind of ads that you want. We got no you. No problem. No problem. All right, cool um uh, nothing's it's not coming up it's not coming up i would recognize the name because she's told me it but all good it's the next dude it's the next frontier breasts are old dicks are in i don't think that's happening <laughs> <laughs> it probably is a very different reaction on the male psyche i suspect i suspect hey who knows but i i think that there's a reason that yeah that we have she said it was mostly for comedic effect wow that's fascinating yeah so the the penis is there for a gag. I think so. The breasts are not there for a gag. There's it's not a laugh. There's never a punchline no, no. in The Witcher about breasts ever. In fact, they're almost they're never discussed. No, they're always background. Well, foreground, unspoken foreground, in your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unspoken. T- yes, but technically, if you were to read the script, you wouldn't know that there was anything about nudity occurring versus yeah. it sounds like in your mom's thing it's the punchline of a I think joke. so I don't know I'll have to get the facts interesting I'll have to get the facts I could be wrong penises are funny I've misspoken on here before yeah. called someone my uncle that was my great uncle yeah. she watches she's like ah you were wrong about this oh well, I'm sorry I'm trying my best <laughs> do you have anything else uh no oh actually do we want to ask about react title suggestions real quick so we did a video on our other channel charisma on command which i think a lot of listeners uh have watched that was charisma coach reacts to cringe or something right like cringy moments Mm -hmm. we want to do more react videos but we have no idea how to thematically tie them together right because you can't just do a bunch of random clips so if anyone listening has any good ideas please let me know in the comments for a title of a react video you think would be fun for Charlie to make. We're hitting that PewDiePie uh, level of just outsourcing the creativity in your content where you just try to get your audience to do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> just set up a subreddit and be like, today we're going to review what you guys made. Very good. <laughs> 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 All right, Justin, what do we got today? So first up, we got a news article about a men's support group called Everyman, which was founded in 2016, predating the Me Too movement, but ignited by the Harvey Weinstein scandal, 
in 2017. Um, so the members of this club are all white Americans ranging in age from 20s to 60s. And the group helps men shrug off the armor of masculinity to get in touch with their true feelings like a sort of anti-fight club. Why do they have to be white? I was just thinking that. Why are they They don't white? have to be white. It just they happen to all be white. Like Interesting. the article just said Maybe that. it happened in Utah or it something. It happened in uh, <laughs> rural Massachusetts. Okay. That could, yeah. it could just be the, the region. Go ahead. Um, And so the group and others like it have been brought into focus by the global reckoning on sexual misconduct, which has caused these men to question their own behavior. Um, So the Everyman co-founder, Dan Doty, says its purpose is not to deal directly with toxic masculinity, but that the issue is never too far away. And he says, we need to meet men where they are and not come in and say, hey, what you're doing is terrible. Every man believes, every man, as in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Organization. The club, yeah, not every man. (laughs) Every man believes men cause hurt because they themselves are hurting ryan zagoni a member says i grew up in louisiana where the definition of a man is very narrow do you hunt or do you play football i didn't do either i grew up feeling like an outsider coming here for the first time gave me role models of other ways to be as a man how to be emotional in a way that is powerful loving empathetic and at the same time strong it's probably true of men and women right if you're gonna say men who cause harm or, or men who hurt people are hurting. It's yeah. probably true of yeah. women who hurt people also. Of course. I often feel that way about a lot of the, uh, I think it's totally fine to have a group that's all men and all women. And I think that's wonderful if that's what you guys choose to do. But I often find that the statements made about men or about women broadly, just you could just say people yeah. <laughs> instead. There are, of course, things that are different, but something, you know, hurt people, hurt people works just as well as hurt men, hurt men. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Can you do me another favor, too? Because I hear this term used in a lot of different ways. Will you get me a definition of toxic masculinity? I had the same thought. Just something we can agree. Just something for this conversation. We can agree on what we're talking about because I hear it used in a lot of different ways. And I don't want us to talk about it without knowing what we're talking about. Sure. Well, one of the the, something that I thought about because I've been watching these cult videos is that I'm becoming very sold on the idea of archetypes in the human psyche Mm -hmm. because as i watch these cult videos the strongest persuasion link you can have is the persuasion link of father it's incredible i mean you know catholic church bless me father for i have sinned Mm -hmm. like how do you gain authority over someone you You say you're their dad the neural circuitry of i am your daddy (laughs) that is how you do it and there's all of these ways in which they do it but you know, the Marines are your brothers. Like, and the drill yeah. sergeant, there's that thing. I'm the, there ain't, there's nobody, but and he, he's yeah. your daddy. You know, like that's. I'm your father oh, now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's built in that there is a daddy circuit. And what do you do with your daddy? You listen to him, yeah. right? Which isn't even true all the time. It's just it's just hardwired into the human psyche. And, and organizations have realized this, yeah. that, that in order to get compliance, be the father. Do you think it is wired into the psyche? Absolutely. So you think dads that have completely disobedient kids? Our father kids, who art in heaven. No, I'm just saying you think yeah. they like create that somehow? That have disobedient kids? Yeah. Oh, no. I think I think that there are uh, – archetypes is not to say that everyone's going to play out the same way. It's, it's that there is – the role of father is an incredibly important one in the human psyche. Like who is, who is the le- this leading male figure? Now, you will have strong emotions towards him that often tend towards deference, but over the course of one's life and particular genetics could go in all the different directions that we see. Got it. Uh, but you will, I mean, they don't say our cousin who aren't, you know, it just yeah, doesn't, yeah, yeah. it doesn't do it. It doesn't come up anywhere. Uh, and so I see that. And then, yeah, this idea of being a man, I needed to know what it was to be a man as something that's an archetypal thing that we have in our head. It's just like, okay, I am a man. What do I need to be in order to be a man? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't just learn. I couldn't look at people. I couldn't learn what it's like to be a plumber. I need to know what it's like to be yeah, a man. Yeah, you don't man. feel like a man just because you are you have a penis and you hit puberty. Yes. That's not enough to check the box of like, I'm a man. Mm-hmm. People even, I mean, this is a little bit of a tangent, but even on dating profiles, women will say, like, I'm looking for a real man. Like if you're not ready to step up and have kids or whatever it is like that i'm looking for a a real man right like as if not wanting that makes you not a real man it's just something that people use descriptively positively or threateningly negatively to say you're lacking it well it's not in a bad way but i think these take these archetypes this is where the most powerful persuasion occurs so you know you go to these uh for good or bad i went to choice center i talked about you would go to what, what was the one that you went to? Landmark. Landmark. Uh, they very much try to push the narrative of family. 
very mm -hmm. you know these are your brothers and your sisters on this like they're they're trying to persuade you by hitting those same things the person on tinder who's telling you what a real man is is trying to tap into that circuitry and what everybody wants to do is they realize that there's a slot for a man that men are driven towards and what they want to do is put their own is definition it for you. Yeah. <laughs> of what it is yeah uh you know and and you know we realize there's a slot for daddy Who's going to be the daddy, right? You know, I want it to be your drill instructor. I want it to be your priest. I want it to be your cult leader. Your cult leader, yeah, right? Interesting. And so that there's these, yeah, there's these things that we're driven towards, and it's a cultural societal <laughs> fight to see what's going to be in that slot. Hmm. Uh, so it's a uh, way to control people, basically. Yes, it's a, it's perhaps the strongest way to control yeah. people, because uh, I mean, you, how else do you get a thousand people to? To a handful of guns, but there weren't a thousand guns. There yeah. were definitely not a thousand guns. Like a, many of the people drank the cyanide. For willingly, yeah. willingly. So yeah, I don't know if you found what toxic masculinity was. Yeah. So here's um, a definition by Terry Cooper's. I guess he talks a lot about psychoanalytic content. Mm -hmm. Um. So he defines it as the need to aggressively com compete and dominate others. And as the constellation of socially regressive male traits that serve to foster domination, the devaluation of women and homophobia and wanton violence. Um, yeah, toxic masculinity serves to outline aspects of hegemonic masculinity that are socially destructive, such as misogyny, homophobia, greed, and violent domination. So socially destructive. So the first part was the one that I was like, competition, I mean, are you kidding me? Our, our most beloved athletes are the ones who we, we love for their... It's Michael Jordan, yeah, who, yeah. who is no, insane. What I what I took from that is is degrading women and yeah, yeah, yeah. what was the other thing? And homophobia. Yep. Those those seem like the repeated words. Sure. Well, the other thing, and and I I just think it's interesting. You know, wanton violence is like. What about UFC? Is that is that wanton violence at that? Oh, I'm level? sure someone would describe sure. that as toxic sure. masculinity. Well, this is what I ran when you into. volunteer to punch each other in the yeah. face. That could be toxic. I think this is a difficulty of every perhaps a definition in the world <laughs> but i'm looking at sociopaths and narcissists and you know a sociopath is someone who doesn't care about other people's feelings it's like well i've seen every person on my block walk past the homeless guy on the corner are we also like when yeah. do we care about other people's feelings when is it wanton violence and when is it appropriate levels of shoving like that's that's the argument that yeah. needs to be had uh and then of course there's other things where you'd be like Okay, don't degrade anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean? yeah. Like, that's, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, don't degrade anyone and don't <laughs> be homophobic. Are, I'm. I guess. Yeah. I. I wonder how it got tied to the word masculine, but mm -hmm. on the whole, as long as this group isn't hurting anyone, they like to get together and talk about stuff. That's cool with yeah, me. Yeah, good for me. Yeah, that's that. That's. I, I really don't honestly forgot care. about this group. <laughs> I don't care what they're talking about. As long as they're not hurting anybody and they're enjoying themselves, they yeah. can get together and just don't make it an all-white group. That's a weird. <laughs> that that part's weird. <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean. If, if it's all white just because that's who your neighbors happen to be and it's yeah. not an exclusive thing then all good uh what else okay this next one's my favorite so <laughs> this one's about an eccentric you guys should see the giant smile on justin's <laughs> face right now okay so an eccentric who garnered fame as a drummer in a hardcore punk band mr mezawa he's japanese mm -hmm. has a habit for attention grabbing stunts earlier this month he promised to share 100 million yen which translates to nine hundred twenty five thousand dollars between 10 randomly selected people who shared one of his tweets his next stunt he is set to be the first civilian passenger to fly around the moon on elon musk's spacex rocket planned for 2023 the mission will be the first lunar journey by humans since 1972 in an online appeal mr mezawa says he wants to share the experience with a special woman this is what he wrote on his website. Oh, man. As feelings, <laughs> as feelings of loneliness and emptiness slowly begin to surge upon me, there's one thing that I think about, continuing to love one woman. I want to find a life partner, and with that future partner of mine, I want to shout our love and, word <laughs> and world peace from outer space. Written in dating profile style, the conditions say applicants must be single, over the age of 20, always positive, and have an interest in going to space. The deadline for applications is the 17th of January. And the final decision will be made at the end of March. Oh, we got to get this podcast out quick. <laughs> People only have a few more days. How old is this guy? Apply now. I think he's he's 50 plus for sure. Okay. I think. And he wants to be over 20. Over 20. <laughs> the reason, I respect that, dude. No 19-year-olds. So this sounds like a nightmare. Because <laughs> when you're halfway to the moon and you guys decide that you get on each other's nerves, 
you have to get to the moon and back, and there's nowhere to go. I mean, there's this no guy TV to watch. Sounds like the type to sexually assault you. Oh, yeah. in your two man space for sure. Uh, like, well, I don't want to say for sure. No, not for sure. But that's a risk. That's a danger. Sounds like he think. No, I, I shouldn't say sexually assault because this is a person out there. It sounds like he's prone to think that if you are on that spaceship with him, that by the time you hit the moon, you will be in love, and it will become natural for you to want to express that. And it might be surprising to him yeah. if you don't. That's not to say he's going to assault anybody. No, maybe not. <clears throat> But in general, I would not tell my sister to get on a spaceship with a man she didn't know and then travel to the moon and back. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, though, it's a big world and he's going to get plenty of applicants. There yeah. are people that want to go. I would have. Also, just flying to the moon on the first SpaceX sounds yeah. terrifying. <laughs> like, did never... you guys watch Apollo 13 growing up? Did you want to be an astronaut? I never really quite got I went to that. space camp. I thought it was cool, actually. Yeah. I flew to Florida when I was like six. Did you like the math and the science or did you like want to go into outer space? I don't even remember. Yeah. I was so young. I do know that I asked to go to space camp. Interesting. Yeah. I was never a space kid. I liked Einstein when I was five or six. Yeah. I thought I was going to invent the time machine. I was almost positive. Uh, I bought a thick, <laughs> like like three-inch thick uh, Albert Einstein autobiography, I think it was, when I was six. A lot of physics in there. Yeah. I did not know what I was getting into. <laughs> My reading level and that book's reading level were not close. Albert Einstein. And they're like, and then he split the atom. It's like, what's an atom? Yeah, not not appropriate no. for that age. Level. No, I was totally lost, but I wanted it. So my I liked, parents got what it. What did I like? I liked the Ninja Turtles. So did I. When I was a kid, I used to walk over sewer grates and stomp on them. <laughs> you guys can come out. <laughs> it's okay. It's cool. It's just me. I'm not going to judge you. I won't tell anyone. Yeah, I really did. <laughs> Turtles and Power Rangers for me. I didn't like any scientists. Uh -huh. No any... Power Rangers for me. Did you ever read Animorphs? Oh, yeah. Dude, those things. My mom would get angry because she would buy an Animorphs book and I'd finish it by that evening and it'd barely be <laughs> dog-eared and she'd want to like, take it back to Barnes & Noble and be like, my son, you didn't even enjoy this. <laughs> take this book back. Those were so good, man. Anyway, <laughs> that's all I have to say. That's about all we that. have about this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So the first fan question is from Patrick. Hi, Patrick. He asks, how do you two posit radical honesty in the context of dating and intimate relationships? I recently discovered red pill theory. I don't particularly prescribe to it, but they suggest using covert forms of communication to generate and hopefully perpetuate interest with a girl. Girls are attracted to this, they say. In your experience, how do you behave with enough honesty to build rapport and a trusting relationship while still creating sexual tension and romantic interest? Perhaps you are averse to the red pill, which I would also be interested in hearing you talk about. Yeah. So uh, I think we've talked a little bit about the red pill before. It's a big community of a lot of different beliefs. So I'm just going to address the ones that you're talking about today, which is uh, covert things, planning how to be such that you remain attractive, playing games to make her stay interested, for instance, I would imagine something like uh, leaving her on red on a text to make, even though you know the answers to your plans that night, and even though you might like to text her back to prove that you are high status, for instance. Uh, totally not worth it. <laughs> totally not worth it. So even if that works, what you wind up, the, the prize for you at the end of the day is someone who you have to play games with uh, and doesn't like you when you're expressive in how you truly feel it becomes a job to maintain attraction and what you get out of it is someone who doesn't really want to be with you they want to be with the fake you that you've created who doesn't respond to texts and jerks them around on the other hand this is the other thing with the right, pill. Can, can i play devil's yeah, advocate yeah, yeah. So, so i agree with you let's start with that right but just then for making sure, a more interesting let's... conversation i'll i'll devil's advocate you so what about the idea that once she gets to know the real me she'll like me and i can stop playing games mm. but to start with i i have to leave her on red and try to manipulate her into thinking i'm busy or thinking more about me because she isn't gonna initially like me unless i play these games but once she does and we've hooked up a couple of times i'll just stop the games because then we'll have a real connection yeah so what's the counter to that i mean i'll let do you want to take it? No, no, I want to. Well, sure. I mean, if you want, <laughs> go for it. I think you know the answer. Yeah. Well, so so I guess a couple of things. One is that you. I mean, there's a lot of things. One is you can you start to condition 
behaviors in people, right? So like we went out once with a woman who's super sweet. I was being really sarcastic and kind of a dick because I was just in a mood. I'd just gone through a breakup like the day before. Mm -hmm. I brought out a horrible sarcastic side of her and that is the frame. That's our relationship now. So she's yeah. like really sweet with you, really yeah, sweet with fine. Henry, and then really sarcastic with me because it's like this monster I create, I co-created, yeah. right? So I think that that that's in there too. Your initial attraction. I mean, there is something. There is something to this that you can you can lie your way into having sex with someone, right? But not in a way that's going to be sustainable. Like if if you have to lie and play these games in order to get laid you will get laid but ultimately once you stop she's not going to like who you actually are and this so is a bernie madoff i applied to sexual relationships yeah. like so, you can get you can trick people yeah like and so, but so but so then so like you've okay you've tricked your way into sex now you're acting like who you actually are she's not going to like who you actually are because she decided she liked someone that you were pretending to be mm -hmm. and she'll start to resent you and just treating you badly or breaking up with you. So mm -hmm. so while you can get what you might be aiming at, which is sex one time, I would suggest that what you're aiming at is going to ultimately lead to more unhappiness than happiness because mm -hmm. you're going to end up with a huge headache and a relationship that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, That's the crux of it for me is... I, and I, I'm familiar with some of the stuff and the games that you have to play. And otherwise, it's it's treated almost as if if you don't play these games, she's going to lose interest in you, cheat on you, move on to someone else. And I think that might become true for the type of person who constantly plays games because the only people that stay around them are people who are tolerant and, and respond to those games. It's like you're almost filtering for someone who responds. Well, you filter out the person yeah, who yeah. thinks that it's rude that you didn't respond for six hours. Exactly. You're, you're, you're removing people. The other thing about the red pill, and while I think it is and can be useful to speak in general generalities about men, women, Democrats, Republicans, it's also important to keep in mind, you know, all women are this way. Well, there are some women who are lesbians, right? There are some women who all your male charm will not work on, and they make up a significant portion of the population. So if that exists, it stands to reason that there are other subsets in there that might not want to play those games, right? That might not follow all the standard uh, rules as laid out by this community, even if, and I'm not saying that they are, even if this represents the majority. Mm -hmm. So just my, my philosophy around dating is, we've talked about this, put your most average and normal foot forward while trying to become the best version of yourself. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say is you these a lot of these games were created by people who saw it working for someone else that was doing it unthinkingly mm -hmm. and so i think rather than try to mimic that behavior why why would someone leave someone on not red. Yeah. well for, okay let's say not leave on red because once you've read it you could yeah, respond yeah. or whatever but like let's say you get a text and you don't respond for four hours well, if you weren't playing games, what would that mean? Maybe it means you were surfing for four hours. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you're actually indisposed. So instead of worrying about what are the habits of guys that do well with women and how can I try to pretend I'm like that, I would say find the guys that you're trying to model and figure out like why are why are they this way? It's probably because it's not that important to them. They're doing other stuff. They're with their friends. They're doing their hobbies. They have a job they're passionate about. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll I'll actually go too far on accident. I'll check a dating app, message someone, and then forget to check for a week. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I'm like, oh my god, hey, I'm really sorry, and I'll blow that. But it's because I'm doing other stuff, mm -hmm. and like I think that the answer isn't to try to learn what the behavior is that works, and then present yourself as if you're the kind of guy who's doing cool stuff. I think it's become the kind of guy who's doing cool stuff. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And, and then I, sometimes you'll respond 10 seconds after someone texts you and sometimes you'll be busy with your band or your surfing or your art and you won't respond. Sure. And I think that with all things when it comes to uh, social relationships, you can copy the behavior or the place that the behavior comes from. Now, sometimes when you copy the behavior, it can just be helpful. If you're going to speak more with your hands out, it's generally a good idea. Uh, there are other things like you talked about, like, oh, wow, I watched that guy ignore a text. I'm going to copy that. But when you're missing the intent and the place that it comes from, it's just not as yeah. powerful and, in fact, can be counter 
productive to what you might would want it to do. I actually do think it's incredibly useful though to know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like to know that it's unattractive if you are responding within three seconds of every text sure. forever. And that when somebody, when you text somebody and then they respond two hours later, you text three seconds later, they respond six hours later, you, you text back three seconds later, that knowing that that comes off as unattractive is, is very useful, I think, mm -hmm. actually. And then, but I think what's the most useful thing you can do is, is instead of going, oh, that's unattractive, I won't do that, is going, why is this unattractive? Mm -hmm. And that, I think, actually is where incredible learning and personal growth can come from. It's like, why is this unattractive? Because you're, you're ever-present, available, this person that you don't know very well, or maybe if it's a dating app, have never met at all, and you is, hold your, in such is your number regard. one yeah. priority. That's what's unattractive. And what would be attractive is somebody who was nice and funny and kind in their text, but at the same time, was just unavailable, which wasn't there for every three seconds. You know what I mean? And then from, I, like I said, I think that's really, really useful and can inform how you want to grow. Cause I am all about personal growth and personal development. So yeah, I think knowing what is unattractive and why is super helpful. Yeah. In some, I, I actually would be, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to have to play, manipulate, be a certain way that you are not in order to keep anyone in your life. Yeah, and getting <laughs> let, back to radical let alone, honesty. Let alone this person that you're super, you allegedly really love and care about. That sounds terrible. Yeah. What, that's, that's a prison sentence where you have to perform every single day. And I know that that is how these men feel about it, but it, it just doesn't have to be. If you put, if you work on being the best version of yourself and then be your average self, and that is enough, yeah. then you just get to be, you know? Yeah, no, well, we kind of, we jumped right to the Red Pill part, but he asked, how does radical honesty, sure, so this is how does idea. radical honesty yeah. jive with dating, right? He gave you some great examples. So oh, I have to, I actually, <laughs> I have a good story that I'm going to share, but um, I think to answer the first question about, because we're just on the texting games, right, is you don't have to, you can be radically honest if your answer is, I, well, the reason I didn't respond is because I was playing with my band, right, or painting or surfing or whatever shooting a podcast. So it does, it's easy to be radically honest if you do go that route instead of trying to just mimic the the fringe behavior, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing, because the question is kind of like, well, how do I be radically honest in dating because women are attracted to certain things that I can't be honest about? And I had a thing that stuck with me. I went on a date two years ago or something like that with this woman who I had met on a dating app and we were out and we were talking, we were hitting it off. I thought the conversation was going great. I really liked her. And she was talking about her ex and she's like, that's why uh, it's now a deal breaker for me if the person isn't willing to invest just as much or more into a relationship than I am. If they don't want something serious, if they aren't willing to take care of me, like that's just not what I want in a boyfriend anymore. And I went, cool. I'm absolutely going to fail your deal breakers mm -hmm. because I'm not even looking for something exclusive. I'm looking for something that's very casual and fun. And it sounds like that's not what you want at all. And so in my mind, I went, well, we hit it off really well, but this is completely dead. You know, like this just, we're going to, high five and walk away because I literally just told her that I won't do her deal breakers and so then 10 seconds later or 10 minutes later whatever we're still talking I was like all right I'm hung I'm legitimately hungry at this point I'm gonna go back home to get a snack I know that this is not going anywhere because our what we want doesn't match but I'm enjoying this conversation if you want to come back and hang out in my apartment you can no pressure we won't hook up or anything I just like the conversation and she said well why won't we hook up so I was radically honest and I told her that I had no interest in what she wanted from a boyfriend. And what she said was, cool, I'll just take you from the boyfriend slot to something else because I like hanging out with you. Mm -hmm. And if I were trying to play games, what I might have done is tried to present myself yeah, maybe. like she was, oh, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I, I'm not looking for a relationship, but if the right woman. And then what I might have done is gotten a relationship that I didn't want or had sex with her once and then been like ha, ha and then she would be upset yeah right so weirdly enough radical honesty was the only way in which i could see that woman in a way that i actually wanted to for like a longer period of time and then we dated for six months or so yeah so. i would say with the radical honesty it is it's the opposite of a hindrance when it comes from dating it's quite frankly the only way for me to be low stress given how unsuitable of a partner I can be for the vast majority of people. And I feel like I need to tell you all the ways early on that that I, most people wouldn't want to be with me. Because if I don't and I pretend to be the typical style of boyfriend who like wants to go on hikes and like likes going out to restaurants, I'm so – for that person, I'm terrible. Yeah. I stay home. I hang out with the same group of friends. I go to the same small – like I have a very routinized life. 
uh, and I'm not that. And I need to like get that out there. Talking about open relationships, dating casually, if that's where I'm at. Like, I'm, you know, I want to be very clear about that from the get go. Yeah, I've actually uh, seen. So, I, I mean, I think I'm pretty, pretty clear that I don't date yeah. anyone exclusively at this point in my life. I have found that if you say that, if you sleep with someone and then share that piece of information, they will be very upset with you. But if you share that information before you have sex, then any sex that happens is coming under a clear understanding at that moment that it's not going to lead to anything exclusive and you end up with way less hurt feelings mm -hmm. and people are actually on the same page. So again, like radical honesty versus trying to present yourself in what you think she wants yeah. gets you better relationships and they'll be happier because this is a person who maybe would have wanted me to be a boyfriend, but is happy to not as well. But if I had done the three dates, take you out to dinner, and then all of a sudden I say, by the way, no exclusive relationship ever. Now there's this expectation mismatch. Sure. You know what I mean? So I think radical honesty saves you from that. And I actually proactively early on, I can really help to set expectations for the relationship. Yeah. I think what you're bringing up is that there's actually an internal inconsistency because you, you might not know this. I've read some of the stuff in the red pill with this idea of uh, you got to be these things, perform this thing. But also there's this idea of I don't know exactly how it's phrased, but it's it's like being the center of one's own focus in in the sense that uh, the opposite of this would be constantly checking in. Do you like me? Like very concerned with how you feel about me as opposed to how I'm experiencing myself. Yeah. So if you are going in with the question, how do I keep this, make this person attracted? Where is your focus? It's on them. Instantly on them and wondering what I need to be versus if you're asking yourself, how do I make sure that I only spend time with people who are going to be complimentary matches to me? That question is self-focused and they create completely different behaviors. Here, I'm trying to find out your list and live up to it. And here, I'm trying to be like, you won't like me for this. You won't like me for this. You won't like me for this. But also, radical honesty includes all the things that might be attractive mm -hmm. to this person about me. And so what I find is that radical honesty uh, makes for some unique first dates where people will, like you say, a high five and be like, not a match, but like, oh yeah, really just to be clear, not, not every date ends with her <laughs> saying, I want to have sex with you. Sometimes they go, yeah, I actually do want a boyfriend. I'm out of here, but yeah. that's good. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Then not they go a, find a boyfriend. Not a match. Awesome. Great to talk to you. Like have a, have a wonderful uh, life. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that can be very common. Or it's like, actually that's pretty much what I'm looking for as well. And, uh, leads to less stress down the line. It, it truly isn't. Radical honesty is not a hindrance in these. It's it's the way it helps tremendously with uh, eliminating stress in the future. Yeah, and then what? just to clarify, what you want to do is you want to have radical honesty and layer on top of that having a bunch of charismatic habits such that you are attractive. To, sure. <laughs> that you aren't just sitting there monotonely sharing all the things that are terrible. And you're also not being a dick, right? You're not just sitting there going... Oh, I don't like your hair this way. That's the first thing you're saying on a blind date, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you have the radical honesty, but then you also have the tact, the charisma, the other things that help the conversation. I've been actually layering go all well. that stuff back, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been pulling. Back. I know. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm I'm getting older. Maybe I'm not noticing all the times in which I am striking out and rejected. But I do find. I mean, people ask me, "What did you do today?" I'll be like. Oh man, dude, I had to play like six hours of video games. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'd be like, and they're like, you don't, you don't do that. I was like, no, like Friday night for me, that's like Super Smash Bros. or Apex Legends. But see, I think, like, what, I think what you don't, what you're not giving yourself credit for is you are not embarrassed when you share that. That, and this is and what that I'm saying. Is, yeah. That is a char like the charismatic way to present that is that it's totally cool, that mm. it's awesome, that my friends and I do this and it's great. And what some people might do is they might do the radical honesty part, but feel really embarrassed. And mm -hmm. I think oftentimes people just feel about things the way that you sub communicate that they should. So if you're radically honest about the fact that you play like six video, six hours of video I games, probably didn't play six hours. But sure, but I'm just yeah. saying, but you share it in a way where you're ashamed of it. The person you're talking to is going to go, oh, that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Versus if you share it like it's a non thing or like it's awesome, then that's going to influence how the person I, I do just think back and sometimes my advice is and I, again different phases for different times in your life my level of comfort with myself is far higher than it was in my early 20s mm -hmm. when somebody asked me what i spent my day doing in my early 20s i would have selectively focused on the things that i did do that were the most interesting first mm -hmm. and now i 
truly just go, where did the most time go? <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> yeah. And and it winds up on paper being less interesting, but but I think for the reasons that you say, because of the comfort with it, having similar results in terms of uh, intrigue and interest. And then the question is, well, how, wait a second, you played video games all day? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have a job? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I just. No, and I didn't play video games all day. Honestly, what I spend a lot of my days doing is watching YouTube for these videos. Uh, that's that's where my time often goes and what i would probably have to say most days if i was asked that question i watched the witcher on repeat yeah <laughs> i, I watched the same scene of the witcher 17 <laughs> times trying to see if Geralt snarled in a way that was charismatic did you know that lions and zebras <laughs> all right have we answered this question uh, Justin? yeah we're all over the place how do we do did we leave punch, anything out there's there's this yeah. clip of this guy who's in a street fight and he grabs him and he swings a hundred times and he doesn't mm. land once and i feel like that's what we just did <laughs> Honus, right. <laughs> talk about it. corral us in justin <laughs> just talked around it is this right. question unanswered or answered i think that was pretty good i think okay. patrick should let us know all right patrick let us know <laughs> sorry <laughs> um so the next one is from ivan and he says i'm an introverted guy and i have a lot of interactions with with other people on a daily basis. In my current job, it's often 100 plus times. I believe that I have basic knowledge on what I should do to become the charismatic person I want to be. But the thing is, when I start talking with someone, I lose all interest and my mental energy fades. Mm. And I don't know how to change that. I think the basic problem is that I'm not interested in other people. I like reading, literature, watching movies, and analyzing psychology. But actual human interaction requires a lot of mental energy and it's not interesting. Do you have any advice? That's interesting. Yeah, so I can I can sometimes relate. I mean, there's definitely experiences where I feel like that. So if you are an introvert, what I would say is it sounds like your job is pulling you outside of yourself more than you would like and that the balance in your life might not be optimal for you. So consider that a different position in that company. I mean, it sounds like you're very, very extroverted during the day. You stole my answer. Yeah. I was going to say get a new job. Yeah. Because I think, I think you're, if after talking to 100 people, you don't want to talk to strangers, you're probably just burned out. Yeah. And if you had a job where you sat at a desk all day, you actually might learn that you find people you fascinating. You want to talk to 10 strangers. Yeah. And that's, and that's the difference is that there's, I, th I do think everybody has a different level. For somebody, 100 is not enough. For somebody, 100 is perfect. And at that, that's a high level though. I it's mean, a lot. that's all day long being outside of yourself. And as someone who is introverted, I could tell you, I like to talk to a couple people that, you know, and have a few new interactions, but a hundred people every day, that would, that would drain me as well. And I would definitely also get to the point where I was like, I no longer care about you, where I would still be cool at 10 and 15 or whatever. Yeah. But uh, my only thing would be, maybe the takeaway isn't that you are a narcissist who is disinterested in other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe the takeaway is you have a job that burns you out from social interaction. Yeah, yeah. So one, see if there's a way to scale back on that. And sorry, that might be a career change, which I know is a big thing. But if you're finding that it drains you, like life is long. Uh, you could be drained all day or you could spend some time trying to find something more suited to you. Uh, and then your interest, you know, psychology, people, all that stuff. It's, it's super fun to read and spend time contemplating. And then if you have space for it, it can also be fun to take that out into an interaction and to question, to try to understand people. I mean, I, mean, I know that's how I feel. I like to learn these things and these principles of interaction. And then when I'm interacting with someone, ask them questions. And sometimes they can be rather pointed where, you know, somebody will be describing something. I'll be like, I know this is random. I sometimes do this on dates, be like, what's your relationship like with your mother and father? <laughs> and then they'll tell me, I'll be like, oh, that's interesting because I read yada, 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 and you describe all these ambitious traits, which is lines up with these types of things. So there's, for me, I often find a chance to apply those fun introverted things in interactions if they're done in the right amount for me. Anything else? No. Cool. Uh, this one's from someone anonymous from our Google Forms. And they say, for someone who is very interested in meeting new people and who enjoys going out, do you have any tips for going out to bars or clubs alone for the purpose of making new friends or meeting people? I love the friends that I have, but they're pretty insular and don't like going out. Mm. Bars we, get, we get this question a lot. I feel like there's a lot of people in that scenario. They yeah. want to go out more than their friend group does, and they're not sure what to do. Yeah. Any thoughts? For sure. So I would say the thing I see people try to do sometimes, oftentimes this is because they want to improve their dating life, right? So mm -hmm. they'll go out to a bar alone. They'll kind of skulk about the place, yeah, stalk so around. If the answer is friends, I think that there's better environments than 
bar. Was this question clubs. friends? Uh, what do you mean? Like how to make friends? Yeah. Cause I've only ever had this question from people that were worried about dating. Yeah. Um, he said for the purpose of making new friends slash meeting people. And he kind of resolved that he or they um, want to start going out to bars or clubs alone. If it's for things. friends. Yeah, I would never try to make guy friends by going yeah, out to a bar. That's just a bad location to do that at. Yeah, I would make guy friends by going to jiu-jitsu the things that interest and, me. A yeah, jiu-jitsu yeah. gym, surf meetups, pick up basketball. Mm-hmm. I would make friends with people, improv classes. I would just find groups of people that had my interests. Mm-hmm. And I go, cool, I guarantee if me and this person hit it off, we have at least one core interest. Yes. And I would not... If I ever make a friend at a bar, it's an accident. I definitely wouldn't go there on purpose to to make a friend. I think that's a tough environment. I agree. And I think it's because you, what you have to recognize is that people are going to bars, yes, to drink, yes, to hang out with their group of friends. But then the third thing is to meet someone that they're romantically, sexually interested in. Unless it's a dive bar or a sports bar. Sure. Unless it's a dive bar or a sports bar, in which case it might be to scream at the television with people of the same team affiliation. Yeah. Uh, but so yeah, four friends, different environment. Uh, let's presume that the other thing was dating that you were starting. Sure. Well, I mean, honestly, it's applicable to both. It's This isn't dating specific advice. I would just say in general, I wouldn't go to a bar to make friends. But if you are going to go to a bar alone, first of all, kudos. Takes a lot of social courage. I think that's dope. I would say start talking immediately because the mistake I see is people will go in circles, running laps around the bar until they see someone they want to talk to, right? Let's say it's a person you're attracted to or Someone that looks like they make a really cool friend, right? And then you go up and you try to have your first interaction be you approaching this person cold and they haven't seen you except for maybe they've seen you skulking around alone. It's just a really bad setup. You're going to be cold because I do think there's such a thing as social momentum. Mm -hmm. So you're coming in lower than your peak and this person hasn't seen you do anything except for maybe walk around alone. So what I would suggest is when you get into the bar, Start talking to everyone. The moment you walk in, make jokes with the guy that's checking your ID, whoever the first group of people is, say a couple words, make them laugh. If you hit it off with them, stick around, even if there's no one that looks like a good person to be attracted to or friend, depending on what you're looking for. And that means that people that you're not talking to will notice you and see you being social, which will help you when you do approach them, or they might even approach you. And it means when you do find yourself in a conversation with someone you want to connect with, you will be rolling at that point. You know, you'll have told 10 jokes, made three people laugh. You'll be feeling good. You'll be high energy. Your body language will be relaxed. And so once you have that social momentum, it's a lot easier. So that would be my biggest piece of advice. Mm -hmm. If you're going out alone, basically, just start interacting ASAP and start forming little mini temporary connections with a bunch of people in the bar. And then honestly, if you hit people off, you can also return back. I remember I've I've been out to bars and clubs when I was younger and I was going specifically to meet women, but I would go do this, talk to a bunch of people, then I'd go approach a woman and get rejected. And I at least had another group that I had made friends with a half hour ago I could return to, right? I could skulk back Mm to, hang out with those people, kind of like recharge and then go out again. Uh, Versus if I hadn't done that, okay, I get rejected. Now I'm just standing here. My options are stand here, skulk alone, or like pretend that I smoke so I can leave the bar (laughs) for a second. So yeah, I mean, I think in general, it's just really nice to form those little home bases and those warm pockets of social interaction yeah so I've, i don't know that i've ever gone to a bar alone really i if i have it would be like for the a period of time prior to my friends showing up but i've uh, or my friends have left and i've stayed have you ever showed up alone yeah so, I, i've done it not, really what what's what time of your life new york or like no no i think probably brazil or colombia brazil or colombia yeah more like oh definitely yeah 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 traveling when i was traveling for sure yeah uh, when I was staying at a hostel and I didn't know anybody, yes, I would roll into bars alone. And I guess everything you said applied. Speak English. Do you speak English? <laughs> was like the, the common question that I asked everybody. And in those circumstances, I was asking what's fun to do around here. I had pretty easy uh, conversational starters that I that I could throw out. But one of the things that occurred to me as I was just trying to reflect on some of the times where I was, my friends had left and I stayed, they were often at places where there was um, dancing where there was some sort of a thing. I think of uh, Stoney's, right? Where they had line dancing and swing dancing or mm-hmm. whatever, and or their salsa dancing bars. Uh, for whatever reason, those scenes tend to be one, very, very easy to go, do you want to dance? Like, I think that you don't have to learn this skill set if all you want to do is talk to people. But if you have a similar interest in dancing, which can be super fun, learn a basic step, show up to one of these things, they, an hour class, then you stick around after, 
really, really cool social interactions, I think, often come from places that have more structured dancing. For sure. I've never learned structured dancing. You don't have so that's, to. That's optional. That's optional. If you don't have to. You. Uh, but if this is of concern. And then the other thing is, uh, I would just question, you don't have to go out alone. If you start Ben's first advice and you go to jujitsu, pick up basketball, three other hobbies, you're going to meet someone that wants to go yeah. <laughs> hang out at a, at a bar. So you can go out alone. That's not bad. But you can also find someone to go hang with you, uh, you know, chat with them, be fun, engage, lounge, same principles, apply and speak, you know, quickly pull other people into your group. Yeah. I'm sure there are even meetup, like meetup.com meetups for people that want to be social, right? So you could go to one of those, befriend someone, and then now you have someone to go out with. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of options. You could, you could, and you could just go alone, as Ben said. So hope that helps. Any other questions? Nope. That's it. That's it for today. We were way more on point with that one. Yeah, we were <laughs> right in there. Anyways, hope that you guys enjoyed this cast. That's it for this week. Anything? Thanks you for listening. Say? Peace.